All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you'd open your Bible to the book of Judges, chapter 4. And this morning we're going to be in verses 17 to 24. <clears throat> Judges chapter 4, 17 to 24. We've been going through Judges for several weeks now. And the past two weeks we've been looking at the story of Deborah and Barak. And this morning we get to a new character, Jael. Uh, and this, where we get the title of the sermon this morning, Jael's Tent Peg and Jesus' Cross. So let's read the text, open us in a word of prayer, and then we will jump into the sermon this morning. Judges chapter 4, uh, we're going to begin in verse 17, if you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her and to the tent. And she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. And then she went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help now as we dive into this text. This is um, an interesting story, to say the least, God. Um, and yet you have included it in your word. Out of all the stories you could include, you have chosen to include this one which means we know was given to us that we might have endurance, that we might have hope through the scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to glean the truth from, from the story, God, that, to believe that you included the story for a purpose, for a reason, and therefore you must want to teach us something through this story. I pray that we would believe that now as we read and study this. In Jesus' name, amen. I was reading a journal article this week about women who are in jail who read this story. And the women who were in jail, they were there because they had killed their husbands for abuse, which is still a crime. It was interesting to read how they interacted with this story probably is a little bit different than how maybe you or I might interact with the story. Because for them to get to the point of killing someone, they must have been desperate or enraged. And so while violence against violence may be understandable, what I love about Jesus and what I love about the cross is that we are the ones who have offended God. Our offense against the glory of God is greater than any offense that's ever been committed from human to human. And yet God does not react with violence against us. His Son absorbs the full wrath of God on our behalf. And so this morning, though, we get to a story where it is violence against violence. But my hope is to take this story and to help us see how this story points us to Jesus, points us to the cross 
of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're going this morning. We're going to start with the context to kind of bring us up to speed, and then we'll get to exposition of the text, and then we'll get to application of the text. So let's start with the context. If you haven't been here for the past two weeks, here's the context. Deborah is judging the people of God. She's the only woman judge in the story of the book of Judges, and she's judging the people of God. Barak is the commander of the Lord's army, and Sisera is the commander of Jabin's army. Sisera has been oppressing the people of God for 18 years, cruelly oppressing them, but because of their sin. God had given Deborah a message, told her, deliver a message to Barak. Tell him to summon an army of 10,000 men to go meet Sisera in battle with all his troops, all 900 of his chariots, meet him in battle. Barak agrees to go on one condition, that Deborah goes with him. But Deborah agrees to go, but she says to Barak, Barak, because of the way that you're going about this, there will be a consequence. And the consequence is, this victory will not lead to your glory, Barak. The glory will be given to a woman. Now, when we read that story in verse 9, and she says it'll be given to a woman, she's the only woman that we've been introduced to at this point. So, of course, the glory is going to be given to her, right? We'll find out how that's not true. The woman is ambiguous, but we will see who the woman is in just a minute. Barak fights the battle, and it is the Lord who routed Sisera's army, routs every one of them. God gives Barak the victory, and they annihilate every single person except one, Sisera. God in his providence allows Sisera to escape on foot because he has a purpose for this. And we're going to see what that purpose is. That's where we pick up the story this morning. Let's look at verse 17. We're going to get to our exposition of the text. Verse 17, Sisera flees away on foot and he goes to the tent of Jael. Now, as I mentioned last week, verse 11 is preparing us, was preparing us for verse 17. Verse 11 just seems like a... a, a contextual note that has no bearing on the story, but it does. Here's why. Remember last week, we looked at in the book of Numbers. Moses had convinced his father-in-law, Hobab, to come with them to the promised land. Hobab doesn't want to come. Moses convinces him to come. He agrees. He goes with them. Hobab's descendants are the Kenites. And the Kenites have settled in the wilderness of Judah. But Heber separates himself from the Kenites. I guess he didn't like the desert. He moves to northern Naphtali, away from his tribe. We're not told why, but God in his providence knows why. And when Sisera flees away on foot from the battle, he does not go northwest to his hometown, which is a good idea because that's where Barak is looking for him, Herosheth Hagoim. That's where his hometown is. That's where Barak goes, but that's not where Sisera is. Sisera flees to the northeast, to Naphtali. Now, why does he go there? The narrator tells us in verse 17b. The narrator says that he goes to the tent of Jael, who is the wife of Heber. Why? Because there was peace between Jabin and Heber. There was peace between them. Daniel Block writes the expression there for peace, which popular word you guys probably know, shalom, friendly relations. It denotes much more than the absence of hostilities. In contexts like this, it functions as a covenant term. It suggests that an alliance had been made. Some sort of treaty has been made between Jabin and the house of Heber. They have this kind of alliance. So it appears that Heber has not only separated from his clan, but he has entered into a peaceful alliance with King Jabin. And so, of course, Sisera goes there, believing this is a safe space. This is going to be a safe, demilitarized zone for me. But there may have been peace between Heber and Jabin, but there is not peace between Sisera and Jael. Now, Sisera doesn't know that, apparently, but we'll see why. We're introduced to this new character in the story, Jael. Who is this character? Well, we're told four things about her, and that's it. Number one, she's a woman. Two, she's not an Israelite. Three, 
Her name means wild goat. I don't think that means anything. Four, she's married to Heber. That's all we know. The biblical writers love to introduce us to new characters with really no introductory information. They just introduce somebody, and there you go. That's all we know about her. Verse 18, uh, he goes to the tent, she talks to him, he goes inside the tent and covers him with a rug. The story of Jael and Sisera in many ways is about role reversal. I want you to keep that in mind, role reversal. What do I mean by that? Sisera, the mighty warrior, the man who had oppressed them for 18 years, the man who, in Jewish folktale, whose voice was supposed to be able to chain animals to the spot, whose beard could catch a multitude of fish when he dived into the river, whose chariot was drawn by 900 horses. This mighty man is now being comforted to not be afraid by a woman. Notice Jael is not afraid. She is the one assuring Sisera to not be afraid. Jael's words in the, the Hebrew have a poetic nature to them. They, they have this repetition and chiasm. She says, turn aside, my Lord, turn aside to me. And Sisera listens to her, and he does turn aside to her and goes inside the tent. In Greek mythology, there's a figure called a siren. You may have read about that before. These female-looking creatures that sit on the rocks and they, they sing and they draw the sailors to them. Their voice have this kind of enchanting way of drawing the sailors to them, but in doing so, they wreck their ships on the rocks. Sisera is the siren who is drawing... Uh, Jael is the siren who is <laughs> drawing Sisera into her tent. Once she comes inside, she covers him with a rug or a blanket. Verse 18 does not prepare us in any fashion for what we are about to encounter. It just does not prepare us. Verse 19. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. Now, sister has probably been running for his life, literally. No iron chariot to pull him now. So he's thirsty indeed. Rather than give him water, she gives him milk. In the same way, she says, that a skin of milk. The same way they would put wine into skins, they would put milk into skins to probably make curds out of it. Why does she give him milk? He ordered water. She brought him milk. Why does he do that? Probably to get him to sleep. One commentator said, she doped him and duped him. Now picture the scene here. What do you think of when you see a woman giving a glass of milk and covering someone up? What do you think of? I think of a mom putting her son or daughter to sleep. That's the picture we get here. She gives him a skin of milk, makes sure he's nice and comfy, covers him up. Again, we have role reversal. Sisera, the mighty warrior, is being put to sleep like a little child. But he's not going to have sweet dreams. He's about to have a nightmare. Verse 20. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent. If anyone comes and says, hey, is anyone in here? Say, no. Now, of course, Sisera, though he's exhausted, though he's defeated, though he's about to fall asleep, he can't help himself but give orders. <laughs> he orders Jael, like she's one of his soldiers, to stand at the tent and guard it. And he says, if anyone's here, say no. Now, Sisera is probably thinking of Barak. He probably is, is assuming Barak's going to come looking for him. And he tells her what to do. Now, this is reminiscent of Rahab, Right? Also a woman, also a non-Israelite, also who is hiding someone. Will Jael do the same as Rahab? Will she tell the soldiers who come looking for him that there's no one here? No, she will not. Why? Because this man is no Joshua. This man is no Caleb. 
We get to verse 21. Verse 21 has got to be one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Because it's just so shocking. It's so shocking. I want you to picture the scene here. Sisera's lying on the ground. He's got a belly full of milk. He's covered in a blanket. He's lying fast asleep from weariness. The word that's used there by the narrator in the Hebrew describes a deep sleep. And Jael ponders. She paces. What should I do? Five minutes pass. Ten minutes. Fifteen minutes. She ponders. She paces. All of a sudden, she sees this tent peg. And a hammer. She thinks. She contemplates. She has decided. She picks up the tent peg with her left hand. She picks up the hammer with her right hand. And she softly goes over to Sisera. Probably better translated stealthily. The word for softly there, same word used of David when David encounters Saul in the cave and says that David stealthily crept up to Saul and cut off a corner of his robe. Same word there. Jael, like a ninja, creeps over to Sisera. Takes the tent peg as he's laying on the ground, puts it to his temple, rears back with her hammer, and slams down, driving the tent peg through his head into the ground. She hits it so hard it goes all the way into the ground and he dies. Now we don't know if this tent peg was made of wood or iron, but if it was iron, consider the irony Sisera, the commander of iron chariots, has been killed by an iron tent peg. We're left to wonder if Heber knew his wife was capable of such violence. Did he have any idea that his wife was capable of such a thing? The great question I have with this story is, why did Jael kill him? You ever wonder that? She's not an Israelite. Her husband is an ally of Jabin. Sisera, as far as we know, has done her no wrong. What motive did she have to kill him? We will never know for sure. But what we do know is that the woman in verse 9 the woman that the narrator told us that the glory would go to a woman, it's not Deborah, it's Jael. God told Deborah that Sisera would be sold into the hands of a woman. God sold Sisera into the hands of this milk-serving, rug-covering, hammer-wielding woman. Don't you love the Word of God? Verse 22. You've got to love verse 22. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, out of nowhere, Barak appears. A day late and a dollar short. We weren't expecting Barak to appear, neither was the narrator. That's why he says, And behold, look, look at this guy. Here comes Barak. Barak appears to have found the trail of Sisera, and he shows up. Perhaps Barak thought the glory could be his after all. Perhaps he did, but his balloon of hope for glory will be popped by Jael's tent peg. 
Jael walks outside her tent and she addresses Barak. We see that Jael is the initiator in this story. She initiates to Sisera. She initiates to Barak. Barak never says a word. He never speaks. Notice Jael says, come and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. What did Barak think in this moment? Would Sisera be tied up? Would he be asleep? Is this a trap? I would have thought, man, maybe this is a trap. I'm not going in that tent. But he goes into the tent, and there is Sisera covered up, lying on the ground with a tent peg through his head. Oh, the priceless look that must have been on Brock's face as he looks at Sisera dead on the ground and then turns and looks at Jael. I might have been running out of there. <laughs> the similarities between Ehud and Jael are striking. Number one, an unlikely assassin. Ehud is a tribute bearer. That's all he was. He was a tribute bearer. Jael is a non-Israelite. Two, God-ordained means. Ehud is left-handed. That allowed his dagger to pass the guards. Jael is a woman, which gave Sisera a false illusion of safety. Three, they both used words before weapons. Ehud says, I have a secret message, O king. Jael says, turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. Four, same Hebrew verb is used. Ehud thrust it into his belly. Jael drove it into his temple. Same Hebrew verb. Five, the final description is similar as well. Ehud, there lay their lord dead on the floor. Jael, there laid Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. What I love about the Lord is that he is not above using anybody to accomplish his purposes. He uses donkeys to rebuke prophets. He uses women to assassinate military commanders. And he uses babies to save the entire world. God is not above using anybody. Verse 23 to 24 in these two verses, we see the marriage of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Divine sovereignty. Notice what the narrator doesn't say. So on that day, Jael subdued Jabin, king of Canaan. No. So on that day, Barak subdued Jabin, king of Canaan. No. So on that day, Deborah subdued Jabin, king of Canaan. No. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan. God won this victory, but God works through human means, does he not? God worked through Deborah and Jael and Barak and the Israelites as a whole. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Deborah prophesied, J Barak battled, Jael assassinated, but God gives the victory. Now, what do we do with that story? We might read that, you know, and be like, what are we supposed to do with this story? How are we supposed to get application from this? I asked myself the same question this week. I have two reminders and one exhortation. Two reminders and one exhortation for application this morning. First reminder, Jael is a great hero, but Jesus is a perfect hero. Jael is a great hero, but Jesus is a perfect hero hero. When we read the story of Jael and Sisera, perhaps we should ask ourselves, how should we view Jael? How should we think about her? Should we view her positively or negatively or both? On the one hand, she used deception and trickery. She violated ancient Near Eastern hospitality customs. If you know anything about the Middle East, hospitality is everything, especially in the ancient Near East. If you invite someone into your house, you do not dishonor them or harm them. She robbed Barak of the glory. She subverted her husband's alliance. She does not ask Heber, hey, can I kill this man? Heber is friends with Jabin. She subverted his alliance. She commits a violent act, to say the least. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, 
God told Deborah that he would sell Sisera into the hands of a woman, which means God planned for this to happen. God delivered his people from Sisera through Jael. So how should we view her? That's the tension of Judges. That's the whole point of the book of Judges. Rarely do we get a neat story. Rarely do we get a hero who is not severely flawed. Most of the characters and judges are described as sinful and weak and severely flawed. Hence our need for Jesus. Our perfect Savior. What made Jesus special was nothing spectacular in the eyes of the world. He wasn't six foot four with dashing good looks and charm for days. He didn't have the muscles of Samson. In fact, he had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. What made Jesus special was that he was the spotless lamb of God. Abraham was a great patriarch, but Jesus always waited on God's timing, always. Moses was a great leader, but Jesus never failed to give glory to God. David was a great king, but Jesus always remained faithful to his bride. Solomon was a wise king, but Jesus never allowed a woman to come between him and his father. All of the judges were great deliverers, but they all leave us longing for something better, someone better. They leave us longing for Jesus. Jael is a great hero, but she is a flawed one. And she too leaves us longing for Jesus. I love my wife. I love her dearly. But she leaves me longing for Jesus. She is blessed by that. I love my children. I love them dearly, but they leave me longing for Jesus. I love this church body. But you leave me longing for Jesus. That's the point. Jael's tent peg is simply a finger in the dike. It's only a matter of time before the flood of sin comes rushing through again. It's going to happen. They need Jesus. They need a better deliverer than this woman. They need Jesus, and so do you and I. Friend, if you're looking to find fulfillment in a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband, or a wife, or a child, or a career. I assure you, it will leave you longing for Jesus. You will wake up after you get it one day, and you will say, why do I still feel empty? Why do I still feel like something's missing? Why? Because you want Jesus. He is what you want. He is what you need. You may not even know it, but that is what you're longing for. Second reminder, Jael points us to Jesus. The story is a pointing. It points us to Jesus. Jesus, let me give you how, where, where I'm getting this. How am I arriving at this point? Jesus took an Old Testament story and he applied it to himself. This is neither here nor there for the sermon. Just bear with me. 
In the Old Testament, the people of God grumbled against God. And God disciplined them. How did he discipline them? He sent them serpents who went and bit them. And they died. Thank the Lord we're not under that covenant anymore. And when they died, and, and, and thousands had died, finally Moses interceded on the people, and Moses had made a pole, and he put a bronze serpent on the pole, and he told the people that all of you who look at this pole, here it is, the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Ma Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he could look at the serpent and live. And then Jesus says in John 3, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him or looks to him, they may have eternal life. Jesus says that the serpent was pointing them to Jesus. They didn't even know it, but that's what it was doing. It was pointing them to Jesus. And so I want to do something similar here. I want to draw a comparison contrast between Jael and Jesus a comparison contrast between Jael and Jesus Jael is an unlikely savior she is not an Israelite she is a woman Jesus is an unlikely savior he is a carpenter did we expect the person to save us from everything to be a carpenter he is from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He runs with the Galilean crowd. Jael takes the initiative. She invites sinful Sisera to come into her tent to justly kill him. Jesus takes the initiative. He invites sinners into his tent to mercifully save them. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jael uses an unlikely instrument to deliver. She uses a wooden tent peg. Jesus uses an unlikely instrument to deliver. He uses a wooden cross. Jael conquers Sisera, the embodiment of oppression. Jesus conquers Satan and sin, the embodiment of our oppression. Jael pierces Sisera to kill him. God pierces his son to save us. He was pierced for our transgressions. Jael crushed Sisera's head with her hammer in her hand. God crushed his son with his hammer of wrath in his hand. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jael poured out Sisera's sinful blood. Jesus poured out his own righteous, precious blood. When Jael drove this wooden peg into the ground, it virtually lifted the oppression of the people. When, when God drove that wooden cross into the ground, it lifted the curse. Jael points us to Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the Old Testament, is to point us to Jesus and our need for Jesus. And last, two reminders and one exhortation. What exhortation do I have for you? What does Jael teach us to do? You should always ask that. What does God want me to do? What does God want me to feel? I tell, I tell my boys that when they're given application. When you give application, what does God want me to feel? What does God want me to think? What does God want me to do? What does Jael teach us to do? Here's my exhortation to you. Be ruthlessly violent against your own sin. Be ruthlessly violent against your own sin. Jael leaves no room for error here. She does not make peace with Sisera in her tent. She does not welcome him in, and she does give him milk, but for a purpose. She's not giving him milk to 
because she likes the guy. She does not knock Cicero over the head. She could have taken the hammer and just hit him over the head. She's ruthlessly violent towards Cicero. And we wonder why. We're given no indication that Cicero had oppressed her family. In fact, her husband is Jabin's ally. So why did she do this? We do not know. But perhaps Cicero's mom does. You're like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, Willis? Uh, uh, we. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 28 to 30. Hold your place. Chapter 5, 28 to 30. This is Cicero's mom speaking, not literally, but in, in poetic fashion in, in, as the, the narrator imagines what she would say. Look at, look at what his mom says. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Cicero wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princess answer, indeed, she answers herself, have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. Now, did you catch what was said there? A womb or two for every man. I'll talk about this more next week when we get to this. But we're left the impression by this that this meant that Sisera was like all conquering generals at this time. Harsh, ruthless, and complete disregard and contempt for women. What does it mean a womb or two for every man? That is simply a euphemism for erotic pleasure and childbearing, meaning women were considered to be spoils of war. And the mom, his mom, is rejoicing in this. You see how twisted it had gotten. Now, we don't know. This is speculation. I'm, I'm saying up front, it's speculation. But perhaps the reason Jael killed him, she had had enough. This man who, when he would conquer people, he treated women like property. He treated them like spoils of war. They were means for him to have erotic pleasure. They were means for him to increase his offspring. Perhaps she had had enough. And so she combats the ruthless, violent nature of Sisera with her own ruthless violence. Now, where am I going with this? Friend, sin is not your friend. Sin is ruthlessly violent towards you and me. There is a reason why Jesus speaks of killing sin violently in the New Testament. Some of these are meant to be hyperbole, but if it were literally true, they're not meant to be hyperbole. They're meant to be literal. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. I told my boys that, and they're like, how would you poke your eye out? They take it quite literally. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. My boys even got that. They said, well, yeah, you could poke your eye out because then when you go to heaven, you'll get a new eye. That's exactly right. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Now let's make sure I say this because I'm on camera here. Lest any of you think that that's meant to be literal, let me encourage you, this is hyperbole here. If your eye causes you to sin, please don't poke your eye out. There are probably about a million things you can do first. If we get to that point, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> but 
consider the fact, why did Jesus tell it this way? He could tell it any way that he wanted. Why did he use such violent language? Ask yourself that question. Jesus says, whoever causes one of the little ones to sin, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Whoa. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, we've done that as a Bible verse, children's Bible verses, and we don't really catch the punch of that because we've never seen a crucifixion. But if you had seen a crucifixion in the flesh, that verse would be very violent in your mind. Take up your cross. Paul says, put to death what is therefore earthly in you. Put it to death. Friends, I am pleading with you as your pastor, but more importantly, as a brother in Christ who loves you dearly, I am pleading with you, don't make peace with your sin. Don't coddle your sin. Don't feed your sin a warm glass of milk and put a blanket over it. Don't do that. Because if your sin left unchecked, if your sin left unrepented of, it will kill you. Eternally. Be ruthlessly violent against your own sin. You say, how do I do that? Well, God has provided us the perfect tent peg, the cross of Jesus Christ. He has provided us the perfect hammer, the sword of the Spirit. And He has provided us the ideal tent in which to do this, the body of Christ. God has given us everything we need to be free from oppression. I pray that we will.